Yeah, so like you said, so neurology is not neurosurgery. So many people do confuse that. We often still get the question of, you know, are you doing brain surgery and all these things? So no. <laughs> Dr. Catherine Lafever, how are you doing, my friend? <laughs> Hi, great to see you. Nice. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to chat with you about uh, some movement disorders, uh, neurology uh, subspecialty, something that I think a lot of students just don't understand, right? What's out there in the subspecialty world? They typically know what neurology is. They know what neurosurgery is. They always confuse the two still. Um, but then there's subspecialty neurology, and that's where movement disorder comes in. Uh, I know you have a bunch of slides, uh, but one of the questions that I love asking right away is, what is bread and butter movement disorder specialty? Yeah, so like you said, so neurology is not neurosurgery, so many people do confuse that. We often still get the question of, you know, are you doing brain surgery and all these things? So, no. <laughs> Although uh, we do work with neurosurgeons quite a bit um, on people for um, the brain stimulation surgery, et cetera. But yeah, so our bread and butter um, is mostly Parkinson disease. Any, anything that moves and shakes, right? So tremors, jerking, twitching, and we'll kind of talk more about that. But I guess um, the majority of patients that most people in this specialty would see is Parkinson's disease. Yeah, I, I think there's there's always this kind of joke in the neurology world that you can you can locate it, but you can't really diagnose it, right? Or not diagnose it, but you can't treat it. Um, yeah, you're not up to date. I know, I know, but... but, but uh, obviously, we're getting more advanced everywhere, but it seems like movement disorder has a ton of stuff going on, which which seems exciting. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I would say this is true for neurology in general. I mean, I think, um, you know, even 20 years ago, there were many things uh, that we could diagnose and not have a lot to offer. But these days, you know, whether it's epilepsy or multiple sclerosis, but there's just tons of new treatments emerging. I mean, just you know, I graduated residency in 2010, and just over the past 10 years, I mean, I have to really, you know, kind of keep up with all the new developments, and in movement disorders, certainly it's been actually true for, you know, much longer, but we actually do have a lot of ways, both with medication, non-pharmacological measures, and surgical options to really help people, and it's actually what really drew me to the field. I mean, when I did my first um, elective rotation during, you know, residency, um, it, it was just fascinating to see people of all ages and, you know, abilities uh, to kind of come in with different types of problem and just, the, you know, not just having the, the diagnostic process, but really having a, a, a range of things to offer to people, I think is very satisfying. Yeah. E even from a the technology standpoint, I was watching a video the other day of like a, a full body suit, some sort of electric <laughs> suit for, for <laughs> Parkinson's. And just like when the suit was off, the the movement ability versus when it was on was just incredible. It was exciting to see. Yeah, I think I've seen that video. So that's not quite the standard yet, but you're right. I mean, ter in terms of technology, both for monitoring and for treatment, but there's lots of uh, research going on, lots of things to kind of get involved in and to be excited about. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. Let's go ahead and jump into your <laughs> slides. I know you have a bunch of information there. And we got some exciting cases as well. Sure, happy to. Can you see my slides? Yep. Okay, perfect. So uh, yeah, I kind of just thought to start out if I would maybe cover a little bit sort of my pathway, because it's always sort of interesting to hear, you know, how did people get to where they are now and so on. So and I know uh, people are watching from very, you know, different backgrounds. So I'm actually from Germany. I'm German national. I went to medical school in Germany and then decided um, afterwards I would like to pursue training in the U.S. I had done a couple of elective rotations during medical school, actually here at Chicago at Northwestern, where I am now, and, and fell in love with Chicago. So, so ultimately, ultimately made it here. Uh, but initially, I um, did pursue my um, internship and residency training at Mayo Clinic. Uh, I have to say Mayo Clinic was one of the uh, places, again, this was like 15 years ago, and if I was a medical student, that was actually um, very open to um, uh, offering uh, elective months to uh, residents from other countries. So they have this very formal program you can apply to and 
uh, come there for a month to work there and, and it's it was a fantastic place to train and they were you know again very open very uh, uh trainee friendly um atmosphere there so i really loved my time here and, um and um, couldn't have wished for a better better training in neurology um, and uh, and then, as I mentioned, uh, during my residency, really fell in love with um, the movement disorders uh, due to some of the you know really fabulous mentors there. Um, Eric Allsfolk is sort of a really big name in, in Parkinson's disease, and uh, it was just really really impressive for me to see how how um, uh, poised and uh, um, you know what a big part of people's lives um, some of these neurologists burden to their patients, because uh, especially for Parkinson's disease, we kind of talk a little bit more about that in a, in a bit, but Parkinson's disease affects so many aspects of people's lives. So you really become almost the primary um, primary care per, uh, specialist for these patients and, and just develop a pretty close um, relationship. So, so I really like that. And, and again, the fact that there are so many different treatments available from here. Um, so after I decided on on wanting to go this career path, I was um, um, going um, a bit east uh, for that specialty training, and I did a one year fellowship at the Israel Deaconess um, Medical Center in Boston. Uh, so most uh, most uh, movement fellowships, you have a bit of a choice if you want to do one or two year fellowship. If they're not um, ACFMT uh, credential, so it's um, a bit more flexibility with the, with the pathways. You don't have to do extra um, certification after fellowship. Uh, so, so they kind of do vary a little bit. Whether the focus is more on uh, surgical training uh, and or be very research heavy and, and so on. So after I did that initial year of more like a clinical training, I, I kind of did decide I, I'm interested in pursuing a bit more uh, research training. And then actually went on um, to work with um, uh, Dr. Mark Hallett, um, who has been at the NIH for many, many years and is um, a big, uh, big name in the movement disorder field. And, um, you know, it's how life kind of plays sometimes. It was just one of these one of these things that a, a friend of mine mentioned, you know, they're still looking for a fellow for next year. I know you're interested in niche research. Why don't you want to talk to him? And um, and that really led to to me become being offered that position and having just a fabulous two years there. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I often feel very privileged because I did do medical medical school in Germany. I wasn't burdened with, you know, $400,000 of student debt. So, so I'm very lucky in that way that, you know, for many people, it's sort of a financial issue, right? You don't want to necessarily take more time than than absolutely necessary to finish your training. And I was in this position where I didn't, you know, didn't really have to worry about uh, paying back my, paying back my debts, and I uh, was able to, you know, do that additional time without really financial repercussions. And um, so, you know, it's it's an individual um, choice, uh, kind of how you know how much training one wants to do. But it was it was a really fabulous time, and um, I got to work with many really interesting and, and fabulous people, and uh, learning a bit more about brain imaging and and, and research methods. And, uh, and then finally, all training has to end. <laughs> I took on a, a faculty position as assistant professor of neurology at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. And for those of you familiar with sort of uh, international medical graduate pathway, uh, it's not easy to actually make that transition. You have to find spots that either serve as medically underserved um, or are kind of in some lower way able to actually offer a position for non-US citizens. And so I got very lucky and uh, was able to go to university to an academic setting there. And um, I was actually there for six years. Um, I was, um, for four years, I was the director of the movement clinic there. And um, was was really a wonderful uh, learning experience. Um, I got more and more interested and invested in um, something called functional movement disorders, and, and we'll, be, we'll talk about that more a bit later, what that means, and started a treatment program in Louisville that attracted patient referrals from, from, to, from really throughout the U.S., and by the time we, well, after we did this for four years, I had seen patients from 27 U.S. states, and so that really took off, and I wanted, I kind of knew I wanted to spend uh, more time with uh, this particular patient population 
And this was really the reason I was looking for opportunities at a greater center where I could be one of more, you know, different faculty members and more be subspecialized within movement disorders. And so that's kind of what led me to joining uh, Northwestern University and uh, starting a, um, a functional movement disorder treatment program here with the Rehab Center in Chicago, with the Shirley Viability Lab, and that's what I'm doing now. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, so um, again, I'm happy to answer any questions and we can kind of do that towards the end or, you know, any questions in terms of the pathway. But um, yeah, but maybe we can just uh, jump into talking about some uh, patient cases and just to give people a bit more of the impression of uh, what a movement specialist does sort of day in and day out. So yeah, so movement disorders are essentially disorders of voluntary movements not caused by weakness or sensory loss. So of course, someone who had a stroke is also has impaired movement, but it's due to weakness, right? So it's um, so that kind of makes it different from a primary movement disorder. Um, they used to be called extrapyramidal disorders, so kind of uh, contrasting the basal ganglia system to more the um, primary motor system. Uh, but um, it's it's kind of more complex than that, than that so the, the, this terminology is falling a bit out of favor. And uh, the most common disorders that we see would be essential tremor, Parkinson's, also drug induced, the medication related movement disorders, and then also restless leg syndrome. And these are not, I mean, these, all these things are so common that uh, if you're a family practitioner, if you're a, a primary care specialist, you're all going to see um, patients with these, these types of, of problems. So jumping into, into this case one, uh, so this is a typical typical day for me. Uh, so I'll have a 64-year-old uh, male come uh, who complains of an uh, eight-month history of shaking in his right hand. And on exam, I will also notice that this patient has masked face, uh, so kind of less, um, less expressions in his face, decreased blink rate, so it can kind of have the impression of kind of staring, uh, staring, uh, be kind of expressionless. And then intermittently, um, his right hand is sort of trembling while he's just sitting in the chair, so at rest. Um, on more uh, detailed exam then, I would also find that the, the uh, same arm where the tremor is also has some rigidity, which means stiffness of the arm, and uh, bradykinesia, or so slowness of movement. And this we usually kind of test by having people do um, uh, rapid alternating movements. So while well, I can kind of tap with this finger fast and quick for pretty long, <laughs> someone with Parkinson would start out pretty well, but then kind of have it decremented the amplitude. So it kind of gets smaller and smaller. And that's pretty specific for Parkinson. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, RH, yeah. RH, it, a lot of people are asking what RH is. I'm assuming right-handed male here. Yeah, yeah, sorry, just means right hand. Sorry. Yep. You're getting you're getting used to all the all the acronyms. I still remember honestly about one of the most um memorable things from coming for my very first rotation in the US was all the acronyms. <laughs> so, it's, it, you know, it's easy to forget once we're kind of so entrenched in the medical system. But yeah, it was just um most of the thing was figuring out the acronyms. So I apologize for for making that same uh, same uh, mistake here. Yeah, so then uh, on gait exam, um, you would see that the same arm that's also stiff and slow has decreased arm swing. So while our arms kind of usually just kind of naturally move and we're walking, someone with Parkinson uh, would kind of hold the, hold the hand, hold the arm more towards, um, towards the body. So sorry, I just gave it away here. But uh, <laughs> all, these, all these features, all these features are very, very consistent uh, for Parkinson's disease. <laughs> so I'll try to be I'll try to be better with the next case here and try to make it more interactive. But um, yeah, so generally what we see in someone with Parkinson um, can really vary over the course of a lifespan, depending on the age of a presentation. And this is just kind of a nice figure from a recent paper in German neurology that kind of demonstrates this. So for many years, uh, you know, movement disorder specialists have kind of used this figure here on the left side to demonstrate Parkinson's, so the kind of a stooped posture, decreased arm swing, you know, 
And, um, you know, uh, Melissa Armstrong here, um, University of Florida has kind of taken it upon herself to give Parkinson's a new look. <laughs> and I think it's important because, you know, the kind of uh, the images we learn kind of, you know, are ingrained in our brains and might uh, might kind of lead to underdiagnosis. You know, when you kind of always expect to only see Parkinson's in someone who's 80 years old, you might not be thinking about it if you see this 40 year old woman, you know. And um, and again, it's Parkinson is a pretty wide spectrum and can present uh, from people in their 40s um, to, you know, start in, the, in, in, the, in their 80s. And it really has to do that, you know, about 10% of Parkinson's is genetic and, and often runs in families versus most of the time, this is more um, uh, idiopathic, multifactorial, um, environmental factors induced and so on. So, so again, I think it's just important to keep in mind, we can see this um, in people throughout their lives and, um, the, the specific features might look a bit different than someone who's younger. Uh, so yeah, I don't know how you typically do this. So if there's any questions, can people put it in the chat? Or? Yeah, so yeah. people are in the chat or we can actually bring people on with us as well to share the screen and ask questions. But we, we typically do that at the end, but it's up to you. We can do whatever you want. Got it, got it. Yeah, I mean, we could probably do it after each case. So um, yeah, um, let me chat a little bit more about um, um, hold on, next slide here, about uh, some of the issues that come up for someone with Parkinson's. So these would be things we would all be, um, that's sort of our job as neurologists. So first of all, we make the diagnosis, and the diagnosis is really made based on the history and exam. And that is true for neurology in general. So we used to, we always kind of learn, you know, 90% of your diagnosis comes from the history and uh, so that can make it very satisfactory because uh, usually we kind of just say, well, yeah, we will do additional testing, lab studies, imaging, but really to kind of confirm our, our diagnosis. Um, but uh, that the, really, uh, that's why we do spend so much time on getting the history compared to some other specialties, maybe. Um, so just as an example, I typically spend 60 minutes with a new patient and 30 minutes with a follow-up patient. Uh, so really a lot of time to to cover, um, cover things in detail. And so after we diagnose someone, there's a lot to talk about, you know? Um, there's, uh, well, when should be tr treatment be started? How do we start treatment? Um, there's medication options, there's non-medication options, and it's more and more um, evident that actually a healthy lifestyle, including almost daily exercise, um, healthy diet, are among the most uh, most uh, powerful interventions we can really and should recommend and really not just sort of say it in a oh yeah make sure you exercise but really give people specific um suggestions and uh here in chicago i have a uh a, a really nice uh, setup and in our we have institute they have a specific we have clinic for parkinson where we can meet the physical occupational therapists and so on um, and, and that can really make a huge difference. So uh, addressing these factors that can potentially slow down the progression, because we don't have a cure yet, but we certainly have a lot to offer. Non-pharmacological treatment approaches, so again, these often include exercise and, and dietary measures. Um, and um, uh, so, yeah, when, when do people benefit from seeing a movement specialist? So oftentimes the diagnosis would be made by even primary care or general neurologist, but then once things get a little bit more complex, um, maybe the initial medications don't work so well anymore, a lot of people really benefit from seeing a movement specialist and we can kind of fine tune uh, the, the treatment and uh, kind of keep up with, with all the new, uh, new uh, modalities that are available, including surgical treatments for those patients where medications uh, don't work well enough anymore. Yeah, well, maybe they can. I don't know if there's any any questions or people people are kind of um, curious about anything about Parkinson's disease. So this would be a good opportunity to ask. Otherwise, um, otherwise, I'm happy to to move on to case number two. Uh, Elizabeth asked about diet and the impact of the quote sad. I'm not sure what that is in regard to movement disorders. Yeah, so if, uh, you know, the, uh, if I uh, remember correctly, I mean, this is like a specific elimination diet where we kind of tried to try to kind of eliminate dairy products, gluten products. Is that uh, maybe she can confirm if that's uh, along the, the lines? Uh, but in general, you know, what we 
uh, in general recommend is more Mediterranean diet or mind diet. So eating lots of uh, fruits and vegetables, eliminating sugar, highly processed foods. Uh, so that has actually shown uh, kind of best evidence for slowing neurodegenerative diseases, including dementia and, and Parkinson's disease. And the evidence for humans, I mean, a lot of it comes more from lab studies. So uh, we can we can certainly see this in animal models, uh, but um, but in retrospective um, studies or kind of uh, looking at people's diet habits over life, that has really become uh, increasingly uh, clear. There's also a, there's actually several epidemiologic studies that show that increased milk uh, consumption is associated with Parkinson's. So again, it's a it's a, just a correlation, and from these types of studies, not a causation. But um, uh, I think uh, we're both probably going to be hearing more of, of these types of uh, correlations over the next years. So SAD equals standard American diet. So they're they're throwing <laughs> uh, some abbreviations at us that we don't know. So. Yeah. Well, now that you mention it, so yes, I have heard this before. So yeah, that's kind of a the SAD, the SAD, uh, the SAD uh, standard American diet. Yeah. It is kind uh, of sorry. funny because our, our American <laughs> diet is pretty sad compared to everyone else. Yeah, no, so I, I think in general, there, yeah, again, I mean, me eating more um, along Mediterranean diet or mind diet, so kind of along these guidelines I mentioned, is, is would be the, the most uh, the common uh, recommendation right now. Yeah. And then exercise is really, uh, you know, becoming more and more clear that that really does make a difference. And I was just hearing... Um, Lori um, Mishley talk about this, who is a, a, a researcher um, in Oregon, and she has looked at um, thousands of thousands of people and uh, habits over a lifetime, and uh, there has been um, a correlation of people, people, the more, and it's really kind of the intensity and the duration that plays a role, so the, in terms of disease progression, so People who exercise six times a week for 30 minutes uh, did better than people who just weekly um, did weekly or twice a week exercise. So there's still more research going on, of course, and then um, uh, but uh, but I think it's becoming increasingly clear that these lifestyle modifications are really really important in addition to medication. Trusty has a very simple question here. Can you explain the physiology of Parkinson's disease? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so right. Or, so or rather, the pathophysiology. <laughs> right, so we could certainly spend a 60 minute talk on that, but sort of a, a very kind of a one sentence answer is essentially there's lack of dopamine. And, and that leads to both the motor and non motor symptoms for many people. So the dopamine, kind of a bit like the oil in the machine, so kind of keeping movements flowing and smooth. And if a the cells in the substantia nigra that essentially produce dopamine degenerate in Parkinson's. You kind of that leads to the main, uh, the majority of the symptoms. And so, with the treatment, with the medication treatment, we try to replace dopamine. So, the standard medication, the levodopa, is a precursor of dopamine and, and does um, is quite effective. I mean, that's one of these things you really send people with a prescription and they, you know, I often check in six weeks later, have them come back or now, you know, do like a televisit. And you often kind of see people and they kind of just say like, wow, you have changed my life, you know? So that's kind of a satisfaction. We get us movement specialists. It can really make a huge difference. So, yeah. yeah, well, maybe we can, uh, we can go on to, to the next case. I'm yeah. happy to answer more questions later. So in this example here, we have a 70-year-old woman who presents with a 10-year history of creeping and crawling sensation in both legs within a few minutes um, of laying in bed at night. Walking, so getting up and walking or kicking her legs uh, provides relief. And then her husband also reports that her legs frequently jerked um, during her sleep. The neurologic exam in this case is actually normal. And interestingly, when I ask about the family history, she reports that her uh, dad, uncle, and sister all had similar symptoms. So does anyone know what that is? And again, this is something we do see pretty frequently in, in just with the general population. And not everyone sees a doctor for this, because some people just assume, well, especially, you know, that's kind of a common pitfall. If, if the rest of the, if half of your family has this issue, you might just assume, well, that's just how it is, right? Yeah. So any, any guesses? Eddie Deo says restless leg syndrome. Lawrence says restless leg syndrome. Okay, okay. You, yeah. you all got it. You all got it. <laughs> 
So very good. So and some of you might even have that or might have people in your family. This is this is a very common issue. Um, most of the time, we kind of say it's idiopathic, meaning you don't exactly know why that is. I mentioned it often does run in family, but they haven't found like a single gene mutation for it. Some people have this associated with peripheral neuropathies or with some disorder of the nerves, but often it's also secondary and um, is more common during pregnancy or other iron deficiency states, some vitamin deficiencies, uh, people with renal issues, medication induced, so there can be a whole host of um, problems that can be related to this. And oftentimes, it's actually, yeah, one of these situations can be very satisfying to just check people's iron level, replace irons or vitamins, and that alone can make people better. And uh, interestingly, this is similar to Parkinson's, um, uh, somewhat of a dopamine deficiency state. So replacing dopamine, uh, giving them similar medications would be used in Parkinson's uh, an hour before the usual symptom onset, usually in the evening. Um, or other medications would be also used in uh, neuropathies can be quite helpful and really, really improve people's quality of life. So again, something that is usually straightforward to diagnose, but uh, surprisingly often gets missed and you can really make a difference in people's lives. Yeah, so that was uh, this case number two. And so Shane, kind of go, Shane yeah. asked, restless leg syndrome is not the same as just compulsively, habitually bouncing your leg, correct? Correct. Yeah. And a lot of people do that, too. So it's just sort of, um, I, I guess, there's kind of just a spectrum of, of what is kind of normal, right? There's people who just um, have sort of, a, it's just a habit, right? It's sort of habitual, um, kind it's of like driving your neighbor in college or in, in high school crazy, just kind of constantly moving your legs and, and yeah. twitching. It, it's just, it's kind of interesting. You know, there's kind of a normal variability in, in uh, sort of um, how fidgety kind of people are in baseline. But yeah, so that usually the rest is like, this, this is um, when it starts, it's very much timed to, um, to a diurnal pattern, meaning it usually starts in the evening. And so people will kind of notice, you know, they have really trouble sitting for a movie in the movie theater without really moving their legs or getting up walking. And, and once they do that, that urge or that kind of inner tension kind of actually stops. So, so it's quite interesting. And it's also, you know, kind of a, it's actually a good example of a disorder that is sort of not completely involuntary. So a lot of movement disorders live a little bit at this borderland of voluntary and involuntary movements and other things kind of affecting that urge to move. Yeah. Is there any other questions on Russ's legs? <laughs> um, is there any documentation of people having restless leg associated with phantom limb? Well, so the people with phantom limb, so that's another very interesting uh, population. So what it is, is essentially after people get an amputation, they often have um, still kind of that, that feeling of, of actually having that limb. And especially if it was very painful, there can often be um, that pain can kind of remain. So there's phantom uh, limp, uh, like a stump pain in some people. But, uh, but yeah, some people can actually have that feeling of like restlessness. So, so yeah, there, there is, um, this does uh, happen in, in this population. It's very important to actually before an amputation is done, if possible, to control pain as much as possible. So, okay. yeah. So if any, if any of you guys ever has uh, that uh, issue, check your iron levels because that's, <laughs> that's often that's often a culprit and it's kind of an easy fix before you jump to medication. So that next patient here we're going to talk about is a 67-year-old male who presents with uh, shaking of both hands for the past 20 years. So um, another of these cases where people kind of can go under the radar for a long time before they finally, you know, come to medical attention. Um, the issue has been worsening in the past three years. He spills food and he's eating, has cut himself during shaving, the handwriting is shaky. And then his, there also is a family history, just like in the last patient. His grandfather had a similar tremor. His daughter has tremor when she feels anxious. The exam shows a moderate postural tremor in both hands, a no-no tremor of the head, which just kind of means the head goes from side to side. Um, and then he has no tremor when he's at rest and um, otherwise his exam and his walk-in are normal. 
So y'all can tell me in the comments now what you what do you think might be his diagnosis? Or uh, this uh, sounds a little bit different than the, the first patient for Parkinson's. Yeah, Jacob says essential tremor. Very good. So that's kind of a classic with Parkinson's being a resting tremor. And I guess I didn't specifically mention it, but a good way to look for it is really just having the patient sit relaxed in a chair, have their hands kind of laying on their legs. Uh, the tremor often comes out more when you actually ask them to close their eyes or kind of distract them, and you'll kind of see that sort of back and forth motion of the hand. Versus essential tremor is more postural and action tremor, so you kind of see it best when you hold their hands up uh, and you add, ask them to put a cup of water and you know drink and kind of a closer the hand comes to the face, it really gets very shaky. So it's also called, used to be called benign essential tremor because um, it often starts out that way or benign familial tremor. Um, when it starts out, it's often very mild, but over the years, it can actually become quite disabling. And you know, if you can't write, if you can't eat or feed yourself without spilling half of it, um, obviously it affects typing, you know, all kind of small um, fine motor activities. So that can actually be um, not so benign, it's quite disabling. So here's kind of an example of the handwriting, um, what, what someone with essential tremor might look like. Now, this is a more severe case. We can see the handwriting is essentially um, illegible here. And, um, and they're drawing that spiral, there's sort of a sinusoid um, rhythm showing the tremor. And with Parkinson, you wouldn't actually expect that because of, because of it being a resting tremor, Parkinson should actually have a fairly normal uh, ability to do this uh, drawing. So what, go back to that one. What's the difference between B and C there? Um, it's, it's the same patient, actually. I think, um, I think it's just done with the right hand and with the left hand. So, okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's okay. and, and then the long one, he's just asked to actually draw a, a straight line. Uh, that, mm. that then becomes very, more like a sinusoid pattern. Okay. So um, for essential tremor, um, it's one of those things, unfortunately, we don't have as much targeted treatment as for Parkinson's. With Parkinson's, we kind of know a lot of the symptoms are dopamine responsive. Essential tremor, despite this actually being the most common form of tremor, um, has actually not seen as much as advances in the field. And most of the medications we use for this are sort of um, kind of uh, are actually uh, the different, um, not kind of designed for tremor in particular. So propranolol is a blood pressure medicine, uh, primidone, topiramate, gabapentin, or seizure medications. Uh, they were just kind of found that as a side effect, they can reduce tremor. So for mild and moderate tremors, they can work pretty well. But if someone has severe tremor, as, as this patient here in the example, um, surgical options become actually very, um, very, very attractive options because medications are just uh, often not quite, uh, quite getting, um, getting uh, adequate success. And so other things, you know, adaptive equipment, so there's a kind of a cool company that made this um, table uh, there, kind of fork and spoon that have a gyrograph. So essentially it has like a linking piece and it tries to counteract the tremor so kind of a spoon will go in the opposite direction than the hand and kind of equal the tremor out. So technology is trying to, you know, offer some 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 other um, kind of things to compensate. But essentially, um, since the 1990s, there has been the option of offering deep brain stimulation surgery. And what that does is putting, um, I often kind of tell patients, you know, we're going to do a pacemaker for you tremor. So you're going um, with an electrode in, in deep parts of her brain and the basal ganglia, so in this case, often the thalamus, and, uh, and putting um, electric stimulation that kind of counteracts the tremor, or corrects abnormal signaling. And uh, just to kind of demonstrate what this can do for patients, this is that same patient, the same patient um, that I just showed in, in the example two slides ago. And uh, after the first um, deep brain stimulation programming session, um, kind of a, I was asking um, the patient to write something and today is a miracle. It's now very logical. And, and again, uh, another, another example where you can, uh, can, be, uh, can have a very, very happy patient uh, with this kind of treatment outcome that's much, much better quality of life. So, um, yeah, so generally we work very closely in a team with a neurosurgeon, a psychologist, um, 
to do a very detailed assessment of patients, make sure there are good candidates for this, but um, especially for essential trauma, the DBS surgery has over 95% success rate and again, can be very, very um, satisfactory and keep people in, you know, employed and all these things when we otherwise would trauma might be too disabled. Interesting. Interesting. All right. So yeah. Any sure. questions? Any questions about that before we go to our last case? So cases. Let's see. So Shane had a question. You mentioned that some movements are between conscious and unconscious movement. Does it over? Does it ever overlap with stimming, waving, shaking arms, tapping fingers, etc., by autistic people? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. I mean, I think it's um, oftentimes in people with autism or people with intellectual disabilities, we see involuntary movements and um, sort of stereotypical movements. People might kind of snap their fingers or kind of make movements of their, their hands that don't really have a purpose. So, you know, it's it's sort of, um, I think, uh, how we label these, these movements and it kind of... Uh, Never be kind of consider them as a, as a as a disorder per se, or kind of part of you know part of autism. So in general, people, yeah, movements that are um, sort of for more fall more in this um, category of um, uh, stereotypical movements or or stimming with autism. We don't usually treat them with medications, but more with potentially behavioral modifications. But the most important thing is really to kind of clarify is this is this really something that needs treatment and who is actually, who is it, um, who's bothered by movement? Is it the patient? Is it more the environment, you know, parents, uh, what kind of adjustments, uh, changes in expectations can we kind of do to, you know, address these things. But um, so yeah, so oftentimes we don't try to treat uh, movements uh, aggressively and we don't really have necessarily medications that would be um, very helpful in suppressing those type of movements anyway. So. Yeah. So yeah, well, maybe we'll come to this last um, case here, and that's sort of a uh, kind of a case of uh, recent <laughs> recent interest. So um, this is a 19-year-old college student with history of anxiety and depression, um, worsened over this past year related to the COVID pandemic. So everyone, obviously, we all have had very unusual year dealing with lots of stressors uh, virtual going all virtual like we're doing right now and uh, and a lot of people do see really um effects on their mental health so what happened with this um uh patient though that she developed fairly sudden onset of tick-like movements affecting her neck shoulders and arms along with um vocal tics so she was yelling out banana bread and no 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 um, this again started all very abruptly over just a couple of days, and um, um, there's some distractibility. So, in the exam, kind of getting the history, she's able to kind of do that. And um, during the actual exam part, these movement gets much worse. So, kind of the more attention is is drawn to the different um, body parts during the exam, the movements were getting a lot worse. And so, interestingly, in this case, there was no previously history of ticks and no family history of ticks. And so we'll, we'll, just, we'll talk a little bit about, well, what are ticks? And again, this is another thing like restless leg syndrome. Some of you, I mean, yeah, we have, uh, we have like over 600 students on here. So with ticks being extremely common, um, there's probably at least, um, oh my gosh, I'm bad at math. <laughs> there's, there's probably many people here um, who actually have ticks or have ticks. Uh, so ticks are generally uh, described as simple or complex movements, um, often stereotyped, but are most common in children. Um, so simple ticks would be anything from eye blinking, throat clearing, shoulder shrugging. There usually is like this urge to move. So people often describe it as just like this tension in the body. And when they do the tick, they do the movement, the tension kind of goes away for a while until it um, goes up again. So in order to actually make a diagnosis of Tourette's syndrome, so kind of a, a tick disorder, uh, more than just a simple tick, um, the criteria require that the age of onset is less than 18, but there's multiple ticks, usually over time. So one tick might replace the other over the years, and at least one vocal tick. 
And typically, so it's just kind of interesting because the way how Tourette's is often displayed in movies is sort of if it's corporalia, so people swearing, people saying, um, you know, obscene things. And that is actually very uncommon with true Tourette's. Um, so the vocal tics uh, more commonly are things like clearing your throat, like humming. Um, so not as disruptive as someone yelling a swear word. And, and it's, uh, you know, somewhat stigmatizing to kind of see Tourette's always displayed as, as this, um, you know, big um, a person who's uh, just very disruptive and, and swearing. Um, commonly in tics, we see um, ADHD, OCD as comorbidities, and they often have a family history of either mental health issues or tics. Um, we have um, medication treatment options available, and milder cases can also respond to habit reversal training, which is a form of behavioral training. So if you paid attention with the case, you're kind of already seeing like, well, it doesn't quite fit. So this person um, we just talked about was over 18. It was very sudden and onset. There was no previous tick history. So, so what is that? Does anyone want to guess? <laughs> So, let's see. Some people have said Tourette's. Some people have said anxiety. Um, lots of Tourette's. Every, everyone's on board the Tourette train. Got it, yeah. Well, and again, so I think it can be very, very, very difficult uh, to actually diagnose uh, these patients accurately. And this is... Um, sort of a, a phenomenon uh, that uh, many, many of my colleagues, especially in pediatric neurology, have seen in the past year. And so I'm pretty active on social media, and I didn't mention that yet, but I'm also one of the administrators of a group called a Women Neurology Group. Uh, we have about 3,500 neurologists in this group uh, from all over the country, most of the U.S., and, um, and it's been a very, very, uh, you know, um, issue that's been brought up over and over again, but people are just asking, like, gosh, I'm seeing, I'm seeing, I'm seeing three patients this week um, in their early 20s or, you know, late teens that have these acute onset of ticks. What, what is this? You know, I mean, this is, this is just unusual. I mean, I just mostly want to state this, but generally Tourette's um, doesn't start like this. Uh, this is generally um, people who've had some ticks uh, in elementary school and ticks change over years. So this is very unusual. And um, um, actually falls under um, the category of a functional movement disorder, or also called um, psychogenic movement disorder. Um, and what these disorders are is that people have deficits that are not explained by like lesions in the, in the nervous system that kind of a brain uh, network disorder, so different parts of the brain not communicating accurately. And uh, there often is a background of uh, more uh, anxiety, depression, um, possibly negative life experiences, uh, even in childhood, uh, more common than in the general population. And um, these patients can produce with a number of symptoms, including tremor, um, gait disorder, dystonia, can really mimic any um, other neurologic disorder. Uh, but what, what allows us to make this diagnosis is that these disorders are often acute in onset, can present from the get-go as very disabling, as, as kind of a mispatient, uh, can be more variable over time, and then symptoms are generally distractible. So what that means is that symptoms often lessen, then people are very focused, or attention is sort of um, on something else, and symptoms uh, generally worsen, then attention is uh, put towards the symptoms. So oftentimes when people talk about their history, they're not going to have these tick-like movements, but once um, you do the exam, it kind of really brings them out. Or things like testing reflexes can lead to very exaggerated responses and, and so on. Um, again, the symptoms can vary quite a bit over time. So I had one, of the, one patient with this um, tick-like movements who was actually a hairdresser. And so I was like asking her, like, well, you know, how are you working if you're having all these um, severe ticks? And what she told me said, well, um, she was only part-time and on the days where she was actually working, the ticks were generally well-behaved and she was able to work as a hairdresser. And generally when she was not working was when she had these more severe ticks. So this, I mean, anyone with any movement disorder will kind of say, well, I have good days and bad days, feeling anxious, feeling, you know, lack of sleep, well, kind of worse than any movement disorder. And is I think a good, um, 
reminder that movement and emotion centers in the brain or circuits are actually closely interconnected. Uh, but um, the FMD, that this is definitely a, kind of a characteristic, and it's just much more variability than you would expect in, in someone with other mental disorders. So how do we address these disorders? Well, the mental health aspect is certainly important, um, and usually multidisciplinary treatment that can include physical, occupational, speech therapy, and also um, uh, using a psychiatrist or psychologist for psychotherapy can be very um, helpful. And I kind of mentioned, this is sort of a, a current uh, a hot topic. Um, we have actually, uh, there's a tick specialist in, from Canada, Dr. Pringsheim, who have, did a presentation about this um, new onset explosive tick disorder um, at the um, at our annual neurology meeting two weeks ago. And I was actually just interviewing her for, for Netscape. So if you go on my, if you're interested to learn more about this, go on my Twitter account and you can uh, watch a 10 minute video about this. Um, so it's actually also um, uh, thought that social media plays a huge role here. Um, so interestingly, there's many people with actual Tourette's disorder who have done a great job advocating for Tourette's and put out a lot of videos of their tics on social media and so what we find is a lot of these people with these um, new onset explosive tics have been following uh, people with tics on social media. And so there might be some sort of a contagion effect, sort of a mimicking uh, effect. So again, not a voluntary process, but certainly um, the recommendation is now that when we see people like this, to really ask them, you know, who do they follow on TikTok? Who do they follow on YouTube? And uh, some of these accounts have actually millions of followers. So there's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really kind of a phenomenon. Um, if you look for ticks on, uh, on the, some of these sites, you find so many videos. And, and, and again, it seems to have some sort of a um, mimicker effect. So for, um, it's, uh, it's always interesting. You know, one thing in movement disorders, you really don't know what you're gonna, what you're gonna encounter. And every patient is, um, is, you know, different and it kind of really keeps it interesting. So. You're happy, again, to be in touch with me um, via social media or send me an email. If you have any questions, it can be of any help. And I'm uh, happy to answer additional, additional questions. All right. If you want to come on and ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand. We have two people here already have their hands raised. We'll bring them on. Thank you for that presentation. Some great cases. Gets the gets the students thinking about what's going on in the world uh, of movement disorder neurology um, all right so i've brought on a few people it takes a couple seconds to bring them on there's amy hello amy hi can you hear me yeah okay so i had a question um it was actually one that was asked in the chat, and I thought it was really interesting. How does technology affect some of the progression of the neurological diseases? And then another really small question was, um, do you ever work with those suffering from epilepsy? Yeah, so there's um, so in terms of technology, I mean, gosh, this past year has changed so much for all of us, right? So I think we all did, um, to some degree, many of us used to do telemedicine, but um, Telemedicine has been in the field of neurology has been really big for acute stroke evaluation. So you can kind of connect a patient somewhere in a rural area. A stroke expert can be really helpful to get these patients timely treatment. Uh, for most other neurologists, um, telemedicine had not been a routine part of the workday. And with the pandemic, things really changed. Um, so since, uh, since um, April of last year, many neurologists have um, very briefly, you know, because we weren't able to see patients in person, have started uh, doing televisits, and this um, has still remained and will kind of remain. Uh, and, uh, no, and I think, I think, oh, sorry, uh, the, the question was the, different. The, the question is around patients using technology. Is that exacerbating any symptoms? Is that creating any sort uh, of. I see, I see. Okay, got disorders? it. Sorry. I, okay, I understood it as like, how do we use technology to assess movement disorders? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in general, I mean, a lot of people use more tracking devices to track their symptoms. A lot of people have, you know, the Apple Health or Fitbit or things like that. 
I wouldn't necessarily say that technology has kind of changed the, the nature of movement disorders. Although one example would be, you know, focal dystonia. So some people who are on their cell phone a lot of the time, there, there can be some related issues uh, related to that. But I would say in general, there's not been a, a kind of a shift in, in the presentation per se. And then I guess the other question was, like, um, oh, sorry, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, my, it seems like my microphone might have gone off. But anyway, um, so... Um, yeah, with epilepsy, there is definitely some overlap. I mean, generally, the epilepsy specialists are separate from movement disorder specialists. Um, but there are some people with um, epilepsy who also have movement disorders, like my clonus and things like that. So, so there is some overlap. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. Sure. Dominica. Yeah, hi. This, my name is Dominica. And right now, I'm a junior in, in Queens College. But I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you know that this was the career you wanted to pursue in the future? Like, yeah, you know, I think a lot of um, life, it, it, there's there's always these uh, these moments, or these um, a lot of it's uh, coincidental, right? Where you just kind of feel really drawn to it, or uh, you know, it's it's there's always kind of you know the the checklist approach. You make pros and cons, and what do you want to do in life, right? But, um, you know, a lot of it is really kind of through the experience of medical school, right? I mean, you spend um, here in the U.S., you spend the third and fourth year rotating for different specialties. And you'll find out pretty pretty quickly if you'd like to be in the OR or not. For example, you know, I kind of knew just after being in the OR for a couple of times, like, gosh, it's really not my thing. I can't stand on the, you know, I just... I just can't do it physically. <laughs> I'm just uh, not, uh, you know, for whatever reason. It's just uh, I can't. I just can't do it. Um, and uh, you know, I'm just kind of the same with a lot of things. But you really, uh, while you shadow someone, while you do an observation, while you work with someone, you just get really fascinated. And then for me, that was kind of neurology. I think it's just, um, you know, arguably the organ that kind of controls the rest of the body. And and uh, just there's still a lot of uh, things to discover, a lot of mystery to discover. And for me, what made so just in general in neurology, what, what made it really, uh, really fascinating for me is actually the overlap with uh, psychiatry and neurology issues, mental health issues, and that really play in a lot. Uh, so, especially as a movement specialist, as I was saying, there's a lot of overlap with mental health issues. And in Parkinson, for example, about 70 or 80 percent of patients will also experience um, depression and anxiety. Uh, people with ticks to rats, we already mentioned, there's a huge um, comorbidity with ADHD, with OCD, and uh, it's kind of true for all of our patients, especially, uh, you know, I'm especially um, interested in, in that field of uh, functional or psychogenic movement disorders. So having really this comprehensive approach, I do work a lot with psychologists, psychiatrists, and really trying to improve people's quality of life and making a huge difference in their day-to-day -day function has been very attractive to me. Uh, can you tell me one of the best experiences you had, like, throughout, like, your career? One of the, I'm sorry, one of the... Like, the best experience you had, like, one that just kind of, like, impacted you somehow? Yeah, I mean, so certainly seeing some patients with a deep brain stimulation, that has been very impactful to go have someone see, go from tremor to no tremor and all these things, but... Uh, like I mentioned, I was specifically or I'm specifically passionate about people with a uh, functional movement disorder. And for me, that kind of moment to kind of like, oh my gosh, this is what I need to do was um, uh, as a resident, as a PGY2 resident, I was kind of working in that movement clinic, shadowing or working with uh, my attendings. And we had a young patient in her 20s um, come in in a wheelchair. She had been in a minor accident, a really minor car accident. She wasn't like ejected out of a car or anything like that. But following the accident, couldn't move her legs at all. She was in a wheelchair. She had been in a wheelchair for five months and all the tests were normal. She had no spinal cord injury. All the nerve tests showed up normal. And so they actually diagnosed her with a functional movement disorder. And at the time, I had never heard of this. I was like, well, what is this? Well, why is, um, you know, how can this be a psychological issue and this person can't move their legs? And then she, um, so this was uh, when I did my residency and at Mayo Clinic, they had actually a physical therapy-based treatment program for these patients. And then we actually saw her back only two weeks later. She was cured. She was walking normally functioning 
And that was very, very fascinating for me to see how we can really help uh, these patients with multidisciplinary treatment and get someone out of the wheelchair. And it's sort of a power of the mind, you know, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a pretty complex topic. We can spend another hour talking about, but that was, that was really um, seeing for me that there, this is really a very underserved patient population. A lot of people don't take serious or just, just tell them like, well, this is just anxiety, you know, and, and just don't offer treatment. This is still unfortunately um, often the case. Um, and how much of a difference you can actually make in these people's lives. So that, that has been a very strong motivator for me. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing that with me. Um, Daniel, hello. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, I just had one question. Um, you know, the, for case four, um, that person, the 19 year old student was diagnosed with functional movement disorder and um, you know, it's because they didn't have the classical kind of um, present presentation of Tourette's syndrome because it came, you know, at age 19, while in Tourette's it's, um, usually below 18. So like, you know, if if this person, the student was, you know, maybe 15, um, would they have been diagnosed with Tourette's instead of functional movement disorder? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And again, it really goes back to actually characterizing the movement. And so, yeah, so no, it's not just, you know, any age cutoff is to some extent arbitrary. And we certainly wouldn't just say, oh, gosh, you're 19, you're too old, you know. So, <laughs> but, uh, but the fact that the, so we're really trying to make this diagnosis based on the type of the movements people have. And um, so the movements are just, and, and you need some, some degree of experience. You know, I wouldn't expect someone who's um, basically a trainee or just, a, you know, it's just starting out in the neurology residency to be really able to tell the difference. Because if you haven't seen a lot, a lot of people with Tourette's, you know, you're not going to really know, well, is this Tourette's or is this a tick or not, right? But, um, but the fact that with these functional movement disorders, there's a lot of variability and distractibility of the movements. The movement, so with ticks, I kind of mentioned some of these examples, eye blinking, clearing your throat. So people usually have these simple ticks. They're called because they're simple rather than complex, where someone might do kind of a, a whole um, sequence of different movements. And that's usually also what we see in. In, uh, in these functional movements, people have a lot of complex phenomena. They might punch the ball, for example. They might say these swear words, but don't actually have simple takes. So it's it's really kind of a whole picture that doesn't fit with the characteristics. But it's often a um, you know valid concern, and people often feel like you know you're just telling me I'm anxious because I have a diagnosis of anxiety, but you're not you're kind of missing all these things going on with me. And so it is certainly very important to do a careful assessment. Just because someone has a history of depression and anxiety doesn't mean they can't have um, another neurologic issue, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. All right, last question, Emma. Emma muted yourself. <laughs> Unmute yourself. There we go. All right. Okay. So I actually have Tourette's, so it was really cool to see you talking about that in the last case. And I was wondering how much as a movement disorder specialist do you encounter people with Tourette's? And also... I've always kind of known about the fact that you have to have at least one vocal tick to have Tourette's, but I was wondering if you have an idea on why that's a criteria when it's probably the same part of the brain affecting the physical tics as well as the vocal tics. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for sharing. Uh, I think it's just, you know, important to, to realize how common, how common uh, tics are. And maybe you see people are really, really you know, uh, taking on very different uh, pathways and people sharing something helpful. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think the criteria, it's sort of a, certainly a problem with um, many criteria, especially, well, to sort of extend uh, many medical conditions that criteria are a lot of times based on averages, right? I mean, there's not necessarily, you know, for Tourette's or tick disorder, we certainly have still, if you understand a lot of um, basic hypophysiology and some risk factors and but certainly, um, you know, there's, I don't think there's necessarily, um, uh, it's sort of 100% etched in stone sort of uh, sort of uh, thing. And, and as knowledge evolves over time, you know, diagnostic criteria get changed. So, you know, it's, I, I think it's just kind of based on the average of people with Tourette's, what we 
typically see um, local ticks to some extent. Um, and again, this is generally not the coprolalia or kind of sparing. It's generally more uh, clearing, coughing, the throat humming, something that um, might often or might even happen next if something like that was present um, you know, in early childhood. Um, so it's, it's really kind of just based on averages. And if someone has um, all the other features of Tourette's, we would but not a vocal tick, we would technically call it a motor tick disorder and not Tourette's, but it's really more semantics and wouldn't necessarily make a difference on how we would treat it. And I'm sorry, but I guess the one question was like, how common do we see it? Yeah, I mean, um, generally, you know, most most people with Tourette's are probably seen by pediatric neurologists because they often present um, in childhood and in some cases get better as people get older. Uh, but um, yeah, I would say um, I, I see a fair amount of, of people with, uh, with ticks in the clinic and there's certain centers of excellence for Tourette's who see them more. So it's certainly something we, we pretty commonly see. Great. Thank you, Emma, for sharing that. <sighs> Catherine, thank you for coming on and sharing your specialty with us and your expertise and having some great cases prepared to present to the students. They they love those things. Uh, any last words of wisdom for everyone here with us? Yeah, gosh, no, thanks so much for all the, all the questions and the interest. Well, I would just say neurology is definitely in demand. I mean, they're... Um, uh, as I, I guess became a little bit clear for some of my examples, although neurologic disorders can present throughout life, um, as people get older, it's more common to get things like essential tremor and Parkinson's. So as we have relation ages, we, we do have a, a need for more neurologists or at least uh, geriatricians and other people taking care of these disorders. Um, so there's certainly, um, you know, a huge demand and you can, uh, you have a lot of options shaping your career, whether you want to be in academic medicine, and private practice, um, you do have a lot of um, options, and um, it's uh, you know it's it's always an interesting. It always makes for an interesting day. Uh, there's just a lot of variability. You make uh, close connections to your patients, often over many many years. Uh, so, if that sounds at all int of interest and appealing to you, then uh, you know definitely I would encourage you to explore the field of neurology in general in more detail. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful night. I'm going to close it out now. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.